This is the um, this is the um, seminar on historic tax credits. Um, my name is Marion McGinnis. Um, I live in Davenport's Gold Coast neighborhood. Um, I was introduced to historic tax credits when a group, a not-for-profit group that my husband and I formed, uh, were trying to save an old house that was falling in the ground. And uh, about that time, Iowa was introducing historic tax credits that also included single-family homes. So we got our uh, our, our um, feet wet doing that. Um, I started doing a volunteer tax credit for my neighbors because everybody was working on houses. Um, that then grew into a business for me um, because there were not enough consultants doing it. I had a person I knew reach out who had a, an apartment building. And so I was self-taught um, on how to do it. About 2012, I started my own company, um, Davenport Historic Preservation Consulting, LLC. Um, and so um, I've continued to do that now. Um, I did in part of the process, then I did uh, go to, um, I did get a master's in historic preservation after I got into it. I was interested, but I had no formal training in it. Um, the historic tax credit program has gotten more complicated since I started doing it. Um, but um, it's an important asset if people, for people living in historic neighborhoods, uh, people with may perhaps um, small businesses that live perhaps in historic commercial district. Um, and so what I'm going to do tonight is give you a, a round robin of what historic tax credits are. Um, I'm going to show you some forms. Um, and I don't want you to be intimidated by anything you see. I tend to write a lot when I do things. But I'm going to show you some forms and um, explain how they work, what the different parts are, just kind of take you through everything. And then uh, hopefully we will have time for questions after. I would ask you to hold your questions till after. If I feel like there's a point where I need to stop, I will, but I'd rather wait till the end. And I'm going to be, we have a camera here, so I'm sorry I'm not looking at people here. We have people here tonight at the library and hopefully people online, of course. So with that, let's get going. So, so what is a historic tax credit? Typically, it is a sum deducted from the total amount the taxpayer owes to a taxing authority. That's the way it works for federal. But in Iowa, a portion of the historic tax credit can be paid back in cash. Um, let's see. Oh, Jack, <laughs> who that is. Um, there are federal and state historic tax credits. And the, the federal tax credit goes back to 1976 when the feds offered a historic rehabilitation tax credit. Um, that's you know right, right at the bicentennial, if you'll remember for income producing properties only. And that started that started the whole process of historic tax credits. And then in 2000, between 2002 and 2006, Iowa introduced a state historic tax credit. The first was for also like the federal for income producing properties. But then in 2006, they added non-income producing owner occupied properties. And so Iowa, you know, you can get a tax credit for both kinds of properties here. Um, the state, there is a state program and a federal program. They work together. State program is administered by the State Historic Preservation Office or SHPO. You're going to hear me talk about SHPO. Um, and the Iowa Economic Development Authority is sort of the, the money end of it. Um, the official name of the program is Historic Preservation and Cultural and Entertainment District Tax Credit. And there is a link. Um, this uh, presentation is going to be somewhere on the library's website. So you'll be able to click through to these um, to these um, locations if you'd like to learn more. Um, the federal program is administered by the National Park Service, and its official name is Historic Preservation Certification Application. Um, and again, there are a lot of information on the National Park Service website. So why would the National Park Service be doing tax credits? Well, that's because the first um, identification, the first uh, Things that were identified as historic were really Native American sites, things like that. When Teddy Roosevelt was president, they started looking to protect um, these sites that were being desecrated, they were being robbed, and the National Park Service was involved in that work. And so it, that's how it evolved. Uh, of course, there are you know, many national parks that have historic buildings, but that's why it's the National Park Service and the Secretary of Interior. Um, so uh, that, that's when that relationship started, long before historic tax credits, of course. Um, the purpose of the programs is to encourage the sensitive rehabilitation of historic buildings or sites. It can be sites sometimes. Ensure that character-defining features and spaces of buildings are retained. 
and to help revitalize um, surrounding neighborhoods and cities. Because some residential single family homes are income producing, uh, like long-term or short-term rentals, they may be eligible for both state historic tax credits and federal historic tax credits. Remember, state historic tax credits are income producing and owner occupied, federal or just income producing, but homes can be can get federal tax credits if they are an income producing property. Um, Iowa allocates $45 million you know, for all uh, tax credit related projects. About 2.25 million of that total is set aside for small projects. And that a small project is less than $750,000 in qualified expenses each year. Um, and that's you know, much more than most houses. So that might be also a small commercial business. Um, it, it, um, most, there are very few tax credit projects for, for owner-occupied homes that are over 750,000. Um, at, the, at the end of the project completion, and we'll talk about all those steps, but what is the benefit? Um, and for, for state historic tax credits, it's a 25% return of qualified rehabilitation expenses. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that is either deducted from state of Iowa tax liability, or there's a percentage now, um, a couple of years ago, our legislature decided that they wanted to keep part of that as a tax thing rather than cash, but it's a combination of state tax liability offsetting debt and cash back. So it is, um, Iowa is a refundable, when you hear about refundable tax credits, that means you're not just getting it off your taxes, which you may or may not owe, you're actually getting, it acts like a rebate in a sense. Um, federal historic tax credits are uncapped the amount every year because um, they're sort of like a rolling thing, start and stop, and sometimes they don't get done. So the federal historic tax credit, there's no sort of amount per year. It's not the way the federal budget works. And for that, completed projects receive a 20% tax credit, so no cash back. It is a true tax credit on federal income taxes, and that has to be taken over five years. So this is when you hear about some of the projects that are happening, the big commercial projects, they're usually taking advantage of, in Iowa, and, down, and especially you hear about this downtown, they're taking advantage of both, because between the state tax credit, which is mostly cash back, which they like, especially people who are from out of state because they have no tax liability here, no state tax, um, that comes back as cash. And then the federal is 20%. And what often happens with the very large projects is the um, um, developer will do what's called syndicating. So they'll find somebody that, that needs a tax credit because they're paying a lot of taxes. That person basically kicks in money to the project and in return, they get that tax credit that they can put against their taxes out. And they usually put less money into the project than the tax credit is worth. And that's kind of called syndication. It's, it's completely legal and there's a very specific way you have to do it or you get in trouble. <laughs> so it has to be done very carefully, but it, it is an appropriate way to use the federal tax credit if you don't have that tax. Um, so what are good candidates for historic tax credit projects? And I'm gonna, I'm kind of going to focus more in on the small tax credit because I know this is what you're interested in. I don't want to spend a, all these presentations are always about the big ones. I'm like, it needs to be about the small ones. So here, what are good candidates for historic tax credits? So you have to ask yourself some questions. Um, does your time frame permit a multi-year project? Does your time frame permit you to wait to do work until approvals are received? You, you, you apply before you do the work, not after. That's something people often are confused about. And you accept the program's premise of protecting historic elements and spaces. There are very specific guidelines, and we'll go through those that must be followed. Do you accept that? Because if you don't have time to let this go through the process, it does take a couple of years, even for a home, um, to get through it. If you can't wait, if you are not, if you want to change everything in your historic home on the inside, then this is not the project. This is not the program for you. Um, so um, what projects are eligible? Let's talk about that. So um, it would be um, it would be buildings listed in or el el eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, this is a um, this um, Davenport has a number of these properties, thanks to good work done by the city many decades ago. 
Um, it can also be buildings that contribute to a historic district that is either listed or eligible for listing in the National Register. Um, we have a lot of historic districts in Davenport. Properties that are designated as local landmarks via local government action. Um, and there, that is a list in Davenport, and it's a small list. And usually those in Davenport are also listed in the National Register, but not always. And then barns, some barns are eligible. Barns constructed prior to 1937 uh, and barns eligible for or listed in the National Register. Um, and so the question becomes, um, is my building historic? Um, so in Davenport, to bring it local, we have almost 1,600 buildings listed in the National Register, and these are in National Register districts. This is a picture of those around Davenport. Um, you can also, um, this is not an active um, map, but you can go on the city's website and it does list. If you go, go to city map and you look through your options, it will tell you, it will list National Register districts and you can look, and there's other ways you can find out. So these are the established districts. The one of the dotted line one, there's two down new ones in um, um, there's two new ones in uh, downtown, and I didn't. Uh, they, this map did not include those, so I just sort of that's my approximation of those. So it, they could be again in a district. This house up here is in um, the on Clay Street. It's in the uh, Riverview Terrace district. This house is on Third Street, and it is sitting individually listed. Um, so they can be individually listed. They don't have to be. So there, there are many houses, especially um, in the West End that are dotted, that are listed in the National Register that are not in a district as well. So those are also eligible. Um, how do you find out? Well, um, there's several sources you can contact. Um, you can um, um, reach out to Davenport staff, Historic Preservation Commission, um, and Matt is the, is the staff liaison. You can contact the State Historic Preservation Office. Getting to them can be a challenge sometimes. You can uh, reach out to the, Dem the Richardson Sloan Special Collections, Denver Public Library. Um, you can email me and I will, I have, a, there, is a da there is a Davenport Historic Survey that SHPO keeps, which for some reason isn't where people can access it. It's not secret, um, but I have a copy of it. I keep myself updated with that so I can tell you, yes, it's, it is or isn't. Um, and then this is a really, you know, everybody, uh, all the, you know, people who are into, well, the, I suppose the people look down on Wikipedia for being a good source. This is the fastest way to find out and get um, um, site inventories for your neighborhood. If you live in a historic neighborhood, they're very hard to find. They're not located in one place. I file, I find them online and file them in my computer, but literally, put in National Register listings plus Davenport, Iowa, and you will, it will, they'll, they'll come up with a list. You click on that and then you go to the bottom where it says uh, references and you click on it and that's usually your site inventory for your neighborhood. So um, it's very frustrating that nobody has these in one place, but that is the fastest way um, to do that. So, um, and um, what you, you all, you do have to be doing substantial rehabilitation um, so what does that mean? Uh, if it's an owner-occupied building, um, and this is the Iowa, this is for state tax credits, it must be, uh, you have to do 25% of the assessed value of the building or $25,000, whichever is less. If it is an income-producing building, you have to be doing 50% of the assessed value of the building or $50,000, whichever is less. And when you look at the assessed value, it's, you can go to the um, um, Scott County, um, um, assessor's website, it shows you the value and you only take the value of the building. The land doesn't count. So it's only 25% of the, of the value of the building or 25,000. Um, that's the measure for state. Um, and, and it does require a three-part application involving SHPO and IEDA. And we're gonna go and get into detail on that. Um, for the federal, uh, federal is a little more complicated. Again, you might not be dealing with that but the rehabilitation must equal the assessed value of the building minus the value of the land minus uh, the depreciation that someone has taken on a commercial property. And that's called the adjusted basis. Um, and um, again, reminder, federal only covers income producing properties. 
It also requires a three-part application, but it's exactly the same application, except the federal right now is on paper and it has a different cover sheet. But pretty much you, everything you submit to SHPO for state, you submit to SHPO for federal, and it is reviewed by SHPO. They're both reviewed by SHPO, so you only have to deal with one office. So you don't have to do, um, you're not going to get a different answer from the federal government, National Park Service, and you are from SHPO. But SHPO is the clearinghouse, and every SHPO, every state that has a SHPO, there's one that doesn't, um, is the clearinghouse for historic tax credits if you're doing federal. Okay, and um, I keep talking about qualified rehabilitation expenses. This is a um, this is this is what that looks like for the uh, the state. There is a form for the state. It's not for the federal. There's a form for the state, and it's basically something. So acquisition costs, purchase your purchase of building does account. If you're doing site work, if you're running water lines, have to run new water lines across your property, that doesn't count. Uh, landscaping, um, but um, addition, if, you're gonna, if you want to do an addition to your house, it's certainly possible to do that. Those costs are included. But um, anything, basically, um, anything that you are um, having to do for your house that, um, um, that, is, um, that is in the house or touches the house, so you're, the steps from the from the, the steps from your street to your house, the steps in the ground to your house don't count, but the steps that lead into your house do count, things like that. So it has to be attached. If you think of attached to the building, um, those things count. And there are lots of different things um, that people don't think about sometimes, like um, your insurance, the insurance that you're paying, property taxes you're paying during construction. Um, it's a little quirky if you're living in the house as well, but if you're not, um, uh, your uh, the insurance you're paying, the home insurance you're paying um, is a, an expense that you can count. So when people think about qualified expenses, they often think about, well, it's just historic, right? And it's not. It's much broader than that. The application process for the federal and state tax credits is the same, as I said. And the historic tax credits cover most elements of rehab that protect your house or building. Um, that's the QRA I was talking about. Uh, so qualified expenses are not limited to historic elements. They're not limited to exterior work. They often include mechanicals, roofs, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, um, just about anything you can think of um, that uh, you're going to do to your house is included is a qualified expense because you're protecting this building and you're preserving this building. So that's why they count. Um, it, the, the application process is not done piecemeal. So when you apply for historic tax credits, you apply for, if you're going to do a number of different things, you apply for all of it at once because you don't want to go through this process multiple times. Um, so you, you apply for, your, if you're doing a roof, if you're redoing electrical, if you're redoing plumbing, if you're redoing you know, a kitchen, whatever, if you're painting your house on the outside, all of those are different elements, and I'll show you what that looks like. They, you all, it all goes as one thing. You don't do this and then this and then this, um, and so um, and so it it is um, putting all that together can take some time, of course. Uh, you can have up to three years to complete the work. You don't have to take three years, but you get three years to complete the work, and so um, that's a that's a benefit as well. Um, and um, for and that's why. A long range plan is it fits kind of a, a long range rehab very well. Um, and for, for, for both state and federal tax credits, there's something called the National Park Service Secretary of Interior Standards and Guidelines that must be followed. Well, what on earth does that mean? It's it, it can it's very specific, but what it says is basically the bottom line is repairs and alterations must not damage or destroy materials, features, or finishes that are important in defining the building's historic character. Um, and that means that you, um, you know, things that are important to the building that define the building, and there's some things that the Park Service sees as defining the building, um, you know, should be protected. It doesn't mean you have to put your house back the way it, the way it was when it was built. You're, you want to upgrade an HVAC system, and so you need to you conditioning in. You need to think carefully about, okay, I'm putting this in, I'm adding ducts, where are those going? 
how does that impact if you have, say, a steric trim in your, a living room? How can I do that and protect those elements that make my house historic? Um, and so um, that's part of the process. There are many, uh, and, and the other thing is that a lot of historic houses, older homes were not built, they don't function the same way new homes function. Um, so where you put insulation um, is very important and critical and how you do that. Um, um, some of the things that we do today to houses, um, like, uh, um, like uh, ceiling um, basements, um, may not be the right thing to do in a historic home because historic houses breathe differently, they function differently than modern houses. And sometimes you can do things to them that hurt them. So if you have a brick house, um, you would never, um, you would never sandblast it. And that was done many times. Well, you don't do that, not because of just aesthetics, but you don't do it because old brick is very soft. And when you sandblast it, you take the coat, the skim, you take the, the cover off that brick and it will now absorb water. You don't use modern mortar to replace, you know, old mortar, because if you do that, the, the old brick is soft and the old mortar is soft. And so you want the moisture that can go through the brick or the stone even to come back out through the mortar, not the face of the brick. So these are things that are, they, they, they are, or some of them are actually based in science rather than what's the right thing to do. Um, so, um, and this is something that certainly people have learned, but there are many resources um, on the Park Service website that kind of take you through the science also of some of these things and, and make recommendations. <coughs> Okay, so how does this work? So there again, I have said it's a three part application, right? So, um, and there are a lot of photos involved, but the state uh, tax credit, remember for houses should be given a state tax credit. Um, it's all digital. Um, so um, you, um, you don't have to go print out a lot of photos for the state at all. Everything is submitted online. So um, you photograph the site, the building, and all the interior rooms from all angles. Um, if there are historic photos available of your house, it's not necessary, but you include those. Um, and then you, you do a, a site, a Davenport site inventory. And this is kind of daunting, I think, for people sometimes, um, but um, it's, and I tend to do ones that are kind of long and they don't have to be that long. Um, but, but basically what you're doing is you're doing a narrative description of the, of the property, what's around it, what the site is like, and, and you, 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 you describe the interior and exterior spaces. I start wide like a zoom lens and zoom in and, and I do all the outside um, and um, you know, it's like an establishing shot, you know, and then your tight shots, right? Um, and so, um, and you do, you photograph every space in your house, whether you're planning to work in it or not. Um, um, and so that can take a couple of pages and you have supporting photos. So you're saying, you know, you've numbered your photos. And so your photos relate to this. And then you do a statement of significance. And that can include information about the building's history, how it relates to the historic district that it's in or the neighborhood in which it's located. It can be the significance of the owner, the significance of the architecture or how the how the building relates to a particular historic thing. You don't have to do all of that and it's safer to pick one. It's easier to pick one. And very often, um, if you can take your cue from the site inventory that was done for your neighborhood when it was listed as a historic district. Uh, there will likely be very little information about your particular house in that, um, in that um, site inventory, but it will talk about the neighborhood. And again, if your house is there, it's probably a contributing structure. So you're, if you think of your house as being one of the elements that contributes to the whole story of your district and how it was established. And there is information there, historical information in that site inventory. Um, now, SHPO tends to require less information from homeowners than they might from a commercial project. Um, and again, you submit all of this online. There's a website, you get everything ready and you load, you know, you load it up. It is a great way to learn more about your home. Um, it, again, I don't want it to be seen as daunting. Um, there are um, resources. You can find resources at the library. There are, there are never as many historic photos because no, you know, we all have 
thousands of photos on our phones. People didn't take that many pictures back in the day, um, but you can, um, you can certainly check the library. The Putnam has historic photos. Um, you kind of have to know something about, you know, who lived in your house to be looking for names. But part of um, finding that, of course, is starting um, at the right here in the library, um, looking at directories and then going back from the directories. There are there are fire maps called Sanborn maps that um, that are dated uh, um, at to certain periods. There are uh, copies of those here in the library. Um, newspaper articles, if you can find newspaper articles or newspaper searches are very helpful in getting information about your home as well. Um, um, so there are a lot of resources and um, there are many things now. I mean, I use newspapers.com all the time because I have a subscription to it, but there are many things here at the library that um, I'm looking at Catherine, but there are many things here downstairs in the library to get you started and, it, and you will learn many things. Um, former owners of your property can be helpful. They may have pictures of their family and it, you don't care about the people, but the house is in the background. I was at one project I'm working on and I didn't care about all the people in the picture. I was looking at the floor. I wanted to see it at, if it had carpet on it. You know, so the, those, you know, look at the, it may tell you something more about your house. Um, and, and, and even if you don't care about the people who were in the pictures. Um, so I want to show you what a site inventory looked like. Again, it sort of looks, and I've, I've annotated it here a little bit. It looks very intimidating, but you just break it down. You know, you're you're looking, and this is the site inventory for my house. Um, so um, the historic name, the address, um, you know, um, it's a building. Um, there are two contributing structures. I have a, there's a carriage house there, and then all these funny numbers. There are there's a there's a list of directions to doing a site inventory. So when you pull this down uh, from the Shippo website, and you'll you'll have to contact Shippo, and they can get you tell you how to register for their site, but you can pull down the instructions as well. So it take so the function or use, there's a whole page of what was its use, what was it built as, what is it now? In your case, it might be it was built as a home and it's still a home. Um, and then a description, um, there again, uh, architectural classifications. Um, you might wanna talk to, that's just where you might wanna call Matt and say, hey, what is my house like? Or, Come to the library and, and ask them about some of those things. Um, and then the significance, I chose two. I had a fairly important person um, and I had an architect that I knew about. And so I was able to, I picked two, but you only have to pick one. And often Chippa will say, just pick one. Um, yours might be associated with significant events because it's the construction of your neighborhood, in fact. Um, most of this, this last part, you don't really have to do much about, but again, it looks intimidating, but just take it step by step and it, it will not be so. And a lot of it, you don't have to answer anything as you can see. Okay, so the narrative description, um, it walks the reviewer through the property and the site. Um, I, I always try to do kind of an opening statement, um, you know, what the site includes, kind of the wide shot, and then I start and I do every side of the house. Um, that's the way I do it. Um, um, I, I talk about, um, you know, the exterior. Um, you want to talk about the roof all the way down to the foundation. Um, and you just kind of look at your house. And if you were, if you were having, I mean, the way you do this and the way I do it, and I kind of get into too much detail probably, and you don't have to get into this much, but like you look at it and how would I just, if somebody could not see my house, maybe they were not able to see, how would I describe my house to them? How would I describe this part, this elevation, how the front, the sides and the back, how would I do that? Um, and then you find the words that way, I think. So, um, and then the interior, uh, my house had been altered to six apartments. So in that case, because we were going to be changing those, I had to go through and say, here are all the changes that happened in my house. Um, and um, because we were going to, I wanted Shibo to be, understand these were not original spaces. They had been chopped up in, into, into other things. Um, and then my photos, which would be attached with this, um, would 
the, like photo, the carriage house photos 10 and 11 were the carriage house. And, and so that's the, that's attached. And then the significance, um, the first was, um, I mean, there were several in this. Um, it is a location in the Hamburg Historic District. Um, it talks about the many kinds of um, <coughs> um, things that were in the Gold Coast. Um, and then, and then I had, I did have a, uh, I did have a, um, because it was individually, and it was, it was locally landmarked as well. They hit, they did a special sheet for it. So, um, and I talked about the architect and I talked about Henry Lisher who built it and his history and his, his he was a very significant man and he was significant when he was living in the house. And then I had the architect. Um, as well. So I talked about that. You might not have an architect, you know, um, at all, but um, so I don't want this to be look complicated. And then they'll ask for a biography, you don't, a bibliography, it, you know, it doesn't have to be every single thing you research, but what were your important things? They ask for a map. I get my maps off, you know, Google or the Scott County Assessor, and I do a screen grab. Um, I do a lot of my map and stuff in Publisher, which is just an easy thing for me. I've used it for years. It's a Microsoft program. And uh, so I can put circles around things. And so I do my maps there and put my little uh, labels. And then when a site map, then when I understand how is it oriented, you always put your direction on your maps. I had some historic photos of this house. I was lucky to have that. Um, uh, even a couple of interiors. And this was through reaching out to people, some of the descendants of the man who built it. So I was fortunate. Um, and then you do for all of your parts, so we're, we'll, we're still talking about the part one, but I'm showing you, you know, you're still, you're gonna do, you're gonna do photos um, of, this is for part three, but you're doing photos, the inside, the outside, you do it from two angles. Um, and this happens for the part one, the part two, and the part three. So in this case, I'm showing work that was completed. But so lots of photos. And then and you do a photo key. And the way you do this, the way I do it, is at the assessor's website, there is a little shape of your house. If you go to the assessor's website, there's a little outline of your house there. Um, and I just take a picture of that. I copy it and paste it in the publisher. And then I draw the lines to make the, you know, I draw the lines to make the rooms. Um, and it's not perfect, but it's enough perfect, you know, SHPO will accept this. Um, so, and then I label things. And then you go in and you say, my photo is looking this way, it's looking that way, it's looking this way. So this corresponds with your photos. This is your photo key. You do it for every floor. Okay, so that's the part one. You send all that stuff in. And go, I'm never doing this again, but <laughs> maybe you never do it again. Um, and then uh, SHPO has 90 days to approve it. Now they may send you an email and say, hey, we've got a question about this. You may, may, they, want, they may want an amendment. They want, want, may want more information. If you don't panic, call them, say, what else do I need to do? And, and let them help you walk you through it. Um, then you move to the part two, which is the description of rehabilitation. Um, and there is between the part one and the part two, so that people don't do all this work preparing, this is what we're going to do, and um, they get there and Chippo goes, no, that's not what you should do. There is a, um, what they call a 1.5, where you um, call them and say, here's what we're thinking about doing. Here's kind of generally what the areas we're going to do. Uh, and that can happen 30 days after you file your part one. You can call Chippo, you make an appointment, it's virtual, you go online um, and they, they have your part one and you send some materials for the 1.5 to say, hey, here's roughly what we're thinking about and you have a conversation about that. So uh, after you have your 1.5, you cannot submit a part two until they send you, yes, your part one has been approved and, and you, were el it's, you were now eligible to, to apply for historic tax credits. So the part one is determining if you're eligible um, and part two is the work plan. So the, the um, description of rehabilitation, um, you describe each element of the plan work. What is the existing? What is the state right now? What is it gonna be? 
I have no air conditioning in my house. Will we install air conditioning? This is where we're putting the outside units. This is where we how we propose to do the duct work, you know, and um, it will not impact historic elements or this is how we're gonna work. You know, this is how we'll work around that. Um, you also include another set of photos and photo keys. Sometimes a lot of these are often just some of the, of the part ones that you submitted. Um, and um, if you're gonna be altering spaces, um, um, rooms, then you're gonna include plans for that. If you were doing mortar work, that they, they will require um, you to do some, um, probably a mortar analysis, depending on the age of your house, um, because, and that will determine, you know, what your original mortar was made of and what you need to put back. Mortar is very, very important because again, it will destroy old historic elements if it's not done correctly. And that's why they're so pinky about it. Um, you do with your part two, you, you also do remember the qualified rehabilitation expense report. You send in your draft saying, this is what I think it's gonna cost. You do have one more shot at it before it's all said and done. And so uh, this is just, this is what I think it's gonna cost. And you break it in. You do not have to send them estimates. You don't send them uh, anything from contractors. You simply fill in that form and say, here's what I think uh, HVAC is gonna cost. Here's what I think. And again, it's a rough, it's a rough because you have one more go at submitting your QRE. You never submit to SHPO any receipts, any estimates. You don't have to do that. So that part's easy. You, you keep that in a file um, at home, and then you'll kind of know what your, your, you think your uh, project's going to cost. Um, now, I just did work with a, a neighbor that was doing this, and they had done their part one, and it was complicated for them. Um, so uh, I ended up doing their part one again, and they did, um, they fixed a storm, a wooden storm that had gotten damaged. They painted their house. Um, they did, um, they had done a chimney. We were able to get that in, even though they already finished it. Um, they did a new stoop and a new handrail. That was all they did. Now, it was a fairly, you know, when you do a roof and paint a big house, that's an extensive project. But that's all they did, and and that was fine. And that's a, that was a tax credit project. So um, they were able to accomplish that work fairly quickly. Um, but, um, you know, we had to do, um, but like for that, I had to photograph every single room in their house. And there wasn't one thing in their house that we were doing inside. But every room has to be photographed. Because Shippo needs to know. Did it look like that before? Does it look like that now? You know, have you, so they want to see everything and that's okay. We just take a lot of pictures. Um, and they, um, so, so that was a tech. So you don't have to be doing something to every single part of your house. You can be doing multiple things in the project and often people are. Okay. So this is kind of, this is an example. Um, these are some of the pages from my project. I'll, I'm going to go down to one, uh, and again, honestly, Shippo has gotten a little more uh, difficult, but like flooring, um, I, you put the approximate date, um, I think the um, existing, in every room of the house, um, save one, original flooring was covered with tile, underlayment, carpeting, vinyl flooring, original fur floors were damaged by this treatment, additionally, floors had been cut and relayed, um, uh, where gas was installed. Some parts of the original floor were in wet areas, were rotted, quarter sawn oak. Um, it was severely damaged. Um, uh, there are two in American and caustic tiles missing from their foyer. So basically, remove carp, remove it all, uh, with um, restoring every existing possible floor using gentlest means possible, uh, retaining historic. Uh, um, flooring where impossible replace like materials um, um, or install minimally um, um, invasive substitute, i.e. click down flooring. Uh, they would ask more about that now. Install ceramic tile in bathrooms um, and then find the historic and caustic Alhambra tile. Um, so um, um, the, again, I and the floor plan, again, it was um, it was confusing the six apartments when we got it. So removing all of that, clearing the downstairs hallway, 
uh, it was a lot of removal and then putting it back in some ways to what it was. And then we did make some changes um, to a bedroom. Typically, um, when you're doing a historic tax credit project, your main, uh, the, most important, the most important rooms in your house are the most public rooms. So the hall, the living rooms, um, less, um, less important are the bedrooms, they're more intimate spaces and bathrooms. You know, so, um, and the, you can do more in those areas, the, the more personal spaces, but the public space, the way the house feels when people go into it is important. And we were reversing, uh, you know, quarters had been cut off and broken into, I mean, you couldn't get through the house. So we were opening all that up. So I think we got some props for that. Um, but um, in any case, um, what I also, what I also did for that project and that's, I used this example because again, I didn't have the architectural plan. So I just, again, used my little footprint from the assessor's office and my little drawing, which I saved a master of before I started putting other stuff on it and just kind of said, here's what we're doing here, here, and here. And my work plan relates to this. So there's really nothing here that isn't on the work plan, but it's a visual um, example of it. And I think that helps the interviewer because they've never seen your house except your photos. So we have we have a little mezzanine. So I did a first and second floor, um, and what we were doing there again. The photos for the part um, two supported that. I had I we were replacing replacement wood windows that the uh, gas had failed on because they will on insulated glass they won't last. Um, and we actually proposed insulated glass, but we did not put it in. We got clear glass, and I'll never have insulated glass in any house I live in again. But in any case, so I actually, I don't know if they would accept this now. I did this in, um, I did this in Publisher. Um, I don't know if they would accept just that now, but um, if you are um, doing replacement windows, um, you can usually get cut sheets. If you have to replace doors, you can get cut sheets from the manufacturer. I will tell you that you, um, uh, if you have a if you're planning this, you have original windows, you absolutely need to repair them. SHPO will not uh, approve replacement windows um, unless you are replacing really bad replacement windows and they have gotten, they've stiffened their requirements. You will not be able to do metal clad windows. That if it's with wood windows, you will need to do wood. Um, they don't, they're not approving that. Any, they did for a while, but they're not really doing that now. So, um, um, so, but your person supplying your window should be able to help you with that. And repairing original is what you really want to do and something that they really push. So um, in any case, but again, they accepted this for me um, as sort of a, here's the standard of the window, so. Um, okay, so now you submitted the part two they might come back and say, hey, you need to give us more information about that. That's an amendment. There's a form. You just tell them what they need. And you can call them and say, I don't understand. Um, walk me through this. Um, but once you've um, finally gotten approved part two, um, and they have 90 days to approve the part two, just like they had 90 days to approve the part one, um, they don't always take that, but they have that. Uh, then um, they say, OK, well, you've gotten approved part two. And now let's move to the contract phase. So that be doesn't begin to, after you have an approved part two, it's an agreement with the property owner and the state. Um, for this, there's a really simple, you know, it's a piece of paperwork that says, I'm not a bad person. I don't have any, I've not been to jail. I don't have any outlying debts. I've paid all my taxes. It's just a checklist, certification list. And you send your, this is where you send your final QRE. Like this is really what it's gonna cost me. And it might be considerably more than your first qualified expense report because that was kind of a rough estimate when you were just starting to think about your project. So, um, so you submit your final QRE report, this certification that you're a good person and um, you get a contract back from the state and they figure in um, the 25% plus 15% um, based on your final QRE report. So that's the amount you're gonna get if you do your project successfully. 
Um, you sign it, return it to the state. The state sends you a signed copy and your three years to do the work starts when they sign the contract. So you actually typically have more than three years to do the work, which is why many people do a number of things in these projects. Um, for just quickly for large projects, um, it's a very different situation. The, the large projects over 750,000 qualified expenses, um, often they compete with each other for dollars. They go into a large pool um, that has held one to two times a year. They get graded on a point system. And it's like, do you have the money to do this project? It's very important. How far are you along already on this project? It's very important. You get a lot of points for that. And then sometimes the location in a city, and if you're creating jobs, there's different kinds of things that help you with your points, but it's very important um, that financial readiness and the completion date. What happened back in the day, early days, they used to draw who was gonna get tax credits by just drawing them out of a hat. And you might not have two cents to start this project, but you, you, know, you got picked. And so then they would go on for years and years. So now they do this rating, this grading system and so, um, because there is a big demand for these big uh, project, these big project dollars. So um, now they're asking those kind of questions and you have to prove your financial readiness too. It's not just, yeah, I'm ready. You have to have things from the bank and stuff. You don't need that for the small project. So you're fine for the small project, but just to let you know how the large projects work. Okay. Uh, and then, um, so, um, uh, you, you do your work, you've got your contract, right? You do your work, you finished it up. You don't have to take three years. It may take much less time. Um, you um, Then uh, your part three is simply another set of photos, uh, all the exteriors, all the interiors, whether or not work was done. Uh, if you've done a lot of work in one area, you might, you know, if you refinished the floors and you, in your kitchen, and you know, in my case, we had a tin ceiling we were saving. so. You know, I did my kitchen from two angles and I did the floor, I made sure they saw the floor and that they saw the ceiling was restored. So you have, may have a few more detailed photos, um, but it's, it's really a set of photos. Um, and then you submit a final QRE report and you say, okay, this is what I spent. They don't ask for receipts. They don't ask, you know, it's between you and if, if, uh, to, if they, if the IRS wants to, you know, wants to audit, I've never heard of an audit happening, but I'm, you know, with this, if the if the qualified amount is more than hundred thousand dollars, then you do have to get an independent accounting firm, and they get your receipts, and they get all of that, and they then write a letter saying, okay, I've I've done this, I've seen the part one photos, I've seen the part two photos, and yes, the work was done, and that's basically what they do is they certify that yes, the work was done. And those costs, those accounting costs are actually a qualified expense. So whatever it costs you, you get you get that. So you wanna figure that if you're gonna be doing more than $100,000 worth of work, you're gonna to wanna to put that cost, an estimate of that cost in your, in your as a QRE of a qualified expense. If it's less than $100,000, then there's no accounting report required. So you don't have to do that and you don't have to return in receipts, nothing, you just hold on to them. That's the SHPO doesn't wanna see that. Uh, now SHPO can say, well, you didn't do this right, you gotta fix it, or you did this all wrong, this is not what you said you're gonna do in the part two, so you're not getting, you know, you're not getting your credits. Um, so they can approve it, require amendments or reject the work. Um, but if you followed your part two approved plan, you should, you don't have a problem, right? Okay, part three approved. Okay, you get a tax certificate is mailed to you. Um, it's for the final amount of the tax credit and you typically submit it in the year following the completion of your project. Um, um, so you get, um, so when you file your, your tax return, you file the tax credit with it. So that they, the, um, the state tax office looks at, okay, how much do you owe? They take that off. I mean, how much would you owe anyway? You might know anything. Um, and then, um, and then they, the, the balance is returned to you in cash. You get a check. You literally get a check from the state of, of Iowa. The, our, leg, our fine legislature um, decided to box things up a little bit last year. And um, they um, decided it was 100% refundable. So you got all cash back. 
um, they decided they wanted to um, um, make it partly refundable and partly a true tax credit, you know, ta uh, credit against your taxes. Um, so what they voted on last year was it, it was starting last July, it's 95% refundable cash back and 5% an offset for state taxes. Next year, it's 10%, 90, 10, 85, 50, 15, 80, 20, and 75, 25. And that, and now it doesn't, that they don't go any lower than that. So it's 75% back in cash and 25% against taxes owed. So, um, but that was not the case before. So, and there were lots of people saying this is a really bad idea. But that's what it is. Um, they were trying to, a few years ago, remove it from homeowners entirely, uh, from owner occupied properties. There was a move afoot to remove that. And some of us raised cane and it went to, um, we, there were people um, on that committee that were from here. And so uh, we, it, didn't, it did not make it out of the committee. So that was good, a good thing. So again, let's talk about the program purpose. Again, it's to encourage sensitive rehabilitation of historic buildings, character defining features and spaces are retained and help revitalize surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and a qualified expense, anything you do to the interior of exterior of an existing building that is attached to the building um, is typically a qualified expense. Uh, the process is a three-part application. You submit everything at once. It's not a rapid process and you apply before the work starts and not after. So questions? I have one. From, and there's no bad question, by the way. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have one from David at home. So he owns a house at, in Prospect Park um, and he's already years into, over a year into restoring it back to the way it was. And they had spent over well over the cost of the house already. Um, do they qualify for tax credits um, since they've already started doing the work? Um, he applied for a 10 year tax freeze from the city, but that's all he knew about. Right. Uh, knew to yeah. do. So he applied for URTE, which is a really good thing to do, and that's helpful. Uh, that is a that is a um, a difficult question, especially if they've done a lot of work. Um, it is um, it you you tip, people typically do not have the photographic evidence that you really need to do this. Now, back in the day when they started, it was much easier to do it, it this way. It was much easier to start to go in after you'd already started. Um, it's not so easy anymore, and because there is so much photographic evidence. Um, so I, he would, you know, if he has still got a lot left to do, if he's got a roof to do, he's got other things to do. Um, but, um, it's, I, it's not a good, I don't, I would say it's not, you know, such, he's not such a good candidate now because if he's really way into it, David, it's probably, it's probably, um, uh, probably not a good candidate. Um, because it is just, you know, they, there, there is so much evidence that's required and there's very specific ways things have to be done as well. Um, so uh, not that you didn't, you might've done everything perfectly, um, but, um, but um, there are many things there are, um, you don't gut houses, you don't open up, you don't make open concept, you know, you gotta like your space a little bit. Um, there's many things that people do that they think is okay and it's not. So. I would have probably have to know about more about the project. You could give it a shot and see if that will work. Um, call Shippo and, and and they'll they're going to ask immediately for photos. They're not going to tell you, oh yeah, that'll be fine. Um, um, you know, if it's um, if you've done everything well, if you have tremendous documentary evidence of photographic evidence of what you've done, you might have a shot at it. It's not impossible, but it's tough. You may have to do some things over, for instance, things like that. So, um, but I wish you luck on that. You have any other? Okay. Any questions in the room? I know I've um, well, put a lot in front of you. <laughs> well, I'm here for St. Anthony's Parish. Yes. And we've got a school building on the property. Yes. Um, it's, 
I was told it's the second oldest building in Davenport. We're trying to get the structure of the building repaired. Fixed. Correct. Would, mm -hmm. that, would we have uh, that qualify, you think? Um, it very possibly could. The way it, the way it could qualify, so you were a not-for-profit. Right. Um, and now I don't know what has been done to the building, if it's been significantly altered since it was listed in the National Register. Um, no, that's no. Okay. And where is St. Anthony's? It's right across the street. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, those buildings, that building has been really altered. I mean, that's got a... Well, that's the original parish. We built a parish center on it. This building is right. sits by itself. It, isn't that the, the one property. that's got the perma stone on it, though? I thought that had a... Some, they had added a stone finish. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not real sure. Yeah. yeah. In any case, we won't... You know, that can be that you'd have to determine. Uh, but um, but um, so uh, the way it works for not for profits, because it is um, because it is the state is uh, refundable, mostly still, um, you can you would get money back as cash. And our, our not for profit, when we did the house, we got you know, we, we didn't have any tax liability, we were filing once it's free, and we were able to get the cash back. So right. it it might indeed be just for um, tax credits, so not for any kind of grant money or there. Um, so there is a different program, but it follows the same guidelines. There is a very limited program. They're HRDP grants, but they only do up to about HDRP? 40, HRDP. HRDP grants. Yeah. And it's from the Department of Cultural Affairs, which is the same department that the State Historic Preservation Office is in. So um, they do very limited and it's, you know, 40,000 is a lot to get from them. Um, and they do, there's one application a year and that's usually in April, which is, you know, good timing to be talking about it now. Um, and there has to be, you know, contribution by the people doing it as well. So um, you don't necessarily have to apply for an entire project, um, but, um, um, but and I don't know if that the building is closing in 30 minutes. I don't know if that building is the library is closing. You would have to see it's listed in the National register as well. Okay. Because it's old, it may be on and you can you've got my email there. I can, you know, you reach out to me and I can um, you know, let I can look on the site inventory and see okay. if it is. Um, but um that's where you would want to know first, okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, uh, not for profits often do, and they do big projects. And what they do when they're doing a big project, um, they will um, syndicate. Again, they don't have a tax liability necessarily, so they'll syndicate it. They'll find somebody, maybe a supporter or maybe a business person who needs a tax credit, and so that's how they get cash infused into projects. And that often happens um, with um, with not for profits. It's so sure, possible you. to do. Does anybody have any other questions for me? Anything back there, Catherine? No, All right. Well, um, I'm. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. I hope this has been helpful. We can, if you have, we have some time. If um, after this, if you want to not ask questions in a big firm and want to ask me one on one, I, and the only other thing I would say, the only other thing I would say is there are some bad words in preservation, um, and uh, they are sandblast, <laughs> gut. <laughs> it's a really bad, really bad word. Um, LVT, luxury vinyl tile. <laughs> There's <laughs> like these are the curse words of historic preservation. <laughs> um, vinyl windows. <laughs> um, uh, there are things that you don't, you know, you just don't say. And I encourage people, you know, um, some of the contractors I work with will use them occasionally just to watch me <laughs> they do it on purpose because <laughs> uh, but there are things that there are there are correct and incorrect ways to deal with old buildings and there are things that will never be approved um in a historic tax credit project because it isn't you know it's you know it, it sort of impacts the essence of the building so um um but um so that was the yeah, those are the those are the two big ones, sand blast and gut. <laughs> it's like no. <laughs> so again, it's about protecting the historic elements in the building, which is what defines the building. It's it's uh, now one question I thought might be asked tonight, um, and and it's a kind of a 
double-edged thing too is well i have a house in a historic district and it's been altered it's got you know vinyl siding it's got this it's got that um one of the things you go back to is what did the house look like when it was listed in the national register so if it had wood siding and has been covered in vinyl um, you may not have a, a very good case to stand unless you're going to reverse it uh, but if it was already changed it was listed that way um, and so there are very hard to read original photos i think the original ones are at shippo but you can barely see the ones um, when they when they did the national register um, site you know the districts there they took photos of all the houses um, so and some of them are already altered so um so and 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 the condition is also not well my house is in terrible shape it's not about how good a condition it's in you know it's uh, how a building can be in horrendous shape and be important and savable um uh, because of its connection to history so it's not always about how your house looks but it can and there have been unfortunately many changes made in a lot of homes since the listings happened which started in Davenport back in the 19, late 1970s um, which is why we have the opportunity um, for our, our homes and buildings to enjoy historic tax credits but then people made changes and that could depending on you know where it is that could impact whether or not you're eligible being a contributing structure in a district the, the bar, if you're individually listed and everything's been changed about this house, that could really hurt you. But being a contributing structure, your, your integrity of your building doesn't have to be quite so great. So it becomes about you're important because you're part of this district. You help define this district. So the integrity of the building materials and things can be a little, is a little bit less important. Okay, well, anyway, Thank you That's, so much for doing that. Oh, you're welcome. Welcome.